Steph Hines here to keep you in the know. Good morning, everybody. I, uh, I'm short a podium. I think the worship team boosted it. It's okay. Go ahead and pull out your Bibles, something to take notes with. I'm going to find one up here. I'll take this one. I'll steal it back. Everybody thankful for our worship team, even though they steal my stuff. Go ahead and pull out your Bible, something to take notes with. You get excited to hear from the Word of God this morning? Awesome. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, that's where we're going to spend some time this morning. It's going to take us a few minutes to get there, but if you get there now, you'll be ready by the time we end up there this morning. We are a note-taking church. If you're new with us, uh, my name's Andrew Zanako. I'm the lead pastor here. I'm, for one, really glad that you're here. Is anybody else glad that you're not alone here in church this morning? Thankful for everybody else who's here. You can uh, take out your Bibles and your notes. I'm going to preach this morning a message that um, is sort of a, a follow-up, or, or maybe a better way to say it would be a part two to the message that I shared last week. Um, if you weren't here or, or didn't catch it online, that's okay. You're not going to be too far behind. I'm going to catch you up a little bit. Last week, I shared a message with us called So Many Voices. So Many Voices. Talking about how in this crazy world that we are living in, uh, with everything that's going on, Sam just said, feels like nothing's normal anymore, and it's wearing us out. Has anybody found yourself a little bit more tired these days than you used to be? The craziness is wearing us out, but maybe the most exhausting part of the, craziest, of the craziness right now is actually the fact that there are so many voices trying to tell you what to do with all of it. It's crazy enough as it is, but now you got to deal with so many voices trying to tell you what to do with all of it. Jesus says that, ooh, Jesus says that he is, uh, we talked about it last week in John 10, he is the good shepherd. Am I right? He says he is the good shepherd. And that in this world full of voices, he is the good shepherd and he is speaking to us. Am I ringing a little bit? Oh, great. Okay. I'm catching my, I, sometimes I hear things. It's the Lord <laughs> trying to tell me where my podium went. Jesus says he's the good shepherd, that he's speaking to us. And the good news is that not only is he speaking, but we can hear his voice. He says that as his sheep, we know his voice, we understand his voice, and that in the midst of so many agendas for your life, does anybody else have an agenda for your life? You feel like anybody else has something they need from you right now? Some place they're trying to take you right now. There are so many agendas for your life, but there is an agenda of the good shepherd. And he makes it clear to us his agenda for you is to lead you into life and life abundantly. That agenda that Jesus has for you is in stark contrast to what Jesus says is the voice of the stranger. Whose agenda, whose one agenda for you is to steal from you, to kill you. And to destroy you. In this world that we are living in right now, you can't always control who is talking to you, but you can control who you're listening to. And as I look back over our last handful of months together as a church, I'm seeing this theme that God has been continuing to bring up for us, this theme of listening. This theme of listening, we talked about it last week. As I started looking back over these last few months, here we spent about 15 weeks going through a handful of different books of the Bible, talking about how do we listen to the voice of God throughout the whole Bible, the different types of literature, the different books. How do we still not just read a book, but how do we listen and hear the voice of God? And a handful of weeks ago, I, I preached a message here called, uh, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And I asked you this simple question if you were here or listened to that message. Are you listening? Are you listening? I know that you hear so many voices right now, but the question is, are you listening? Do you, do you hear? Are, are, are you listening to the heart of humanity crying out in unity across the earth right now under the weight of anxiety, the weight of confusion, the weight of pain and fear and uncertainty and hatred, the weight of sin. Are you listening to the heart of humanity crying, I can't breathe? God has a history of using whatever and whoever he wants to say whatever he wants, however he wants to say it. I guess that's what happens when you're God. 
I read through the, uh, the Bible and one, uh, the, and kind of the, the fastest I had ever read through the whole Bible. I did that earlier this year because one. I was like, I got to get through this whole thing. I'm going to do this as fast as I can and just kind of get the broad scope. And one of the first things I said to Heather when I was done was, I didn't see a single place where God asked for my opinion. <laughs> I'm offended. <laughs> God has a history of using whoever he wants however he wants to say whatever he wants, whenever he wants to say it. And the question right now for us, church, is are you listening? Are you listening? In these days, God is shouting to his church. He is shouting to his church, and I believe that he is using the voices echoing through our streets to shout to his church. And I'm wondering, are you listening? Are we listening? And I want to share a message with you this morning as we follow up on what God's been saying to us for a while, this title, I want you to put it at the top of your notes, No Justice, No Peace. No Justice, No Peace. The Bible says that the battles that we find ourselves in are not battles against flesh and blood. They are battles against spiritual forces of evil and darkness in our world and in the cosmic places in the spiritual realm. Everywhere that you are turning right now in your life, battle lines are being drawn in the sand. Battle lines are being drawn in the sand and they have a purpose to divide humanity, to divide flesh and blood against flesh and blood. And in this world that you are living in, where everywhere you turn, you are finding that you have a new choice to make about a new battle line that you didn't know about yesterday. The gravity of these battle lines is pulling you into this fight against flesh and blood. These battle lines are drawn to divide and they have a gravity about them that is pulling you in. And I don't know if you felt it, but you're like, I feel like I'm supposed to be fighting a lot more people than I thought I was supposed to be fighting. Am I alone? (laughs) Like, oh, I didn't know we were mad at each other now. (laughs) Beloved, church. Jesus, people, your fight is not against flesh and blood. There are battles for us to fight, yes. And you are desperately needed as a child of God for those battles. So please, we got to be careful not to get suckered into the wrong fights. We can't get sucked into the wrong fights. There is a spiritual battle for us to fight right now. There is a spiritual battle for us to fight right now. We have to fight it. It's going to be hard to fight it, though, if we're busy fighting all these battles that aren't ours to fight. There's a spiritual battle for you to fight against against a, a spirit in our world right now, a spirit around us, a spirit in our culture that you are finding yourself fighting against, the spirit of manipulation, a spirit of fear, a spirit of hatred, a spirit of division. It is, it's the stranger that Jesus told us about last week. The stranger, the stranger is trying to control you. The thief that Jesus talked to us about last week. I tried to bring something in for a little bit of an illustration. The best I can do is a picture. But do you know what a marionette doll is? If you look at that. um, Nobody has those these days. I, I tried to find one. I asked a bunch of people. But have you seen these before? These, these kind of like doll puppet things. They have all these strings connected to them. And then the puppeteer up at the top, he's got this like kind of wood thing where all the strings are connected to. And when somebody really knows what they're doing, they can make it act like they know, you know, like a person. Anyways, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, you're like, what are you talking about? It's one of those, okay? But as I was praying for us this morning, as I've been praying about what's going on, it was, it was this picture that came to mind of a marionette doll. This is the agenda of the stranger in your life. This is the agenda of the thief in your life. This is who you need to be fighting in your life. It is the stranger. See, the strategy of the stranger, one of the strategies of the stranger is that if he can label you, he can control you. It is these spirits, this spirit of manipulation, spirit of fear. If you, if you kind of think about those strings as these different spiritual forces that are trying to pull on you right now, one of the strategies is if I can label you, I can control you. If I can label you a Republican or a Democrat, then as soon as you step out of line, I can snap you back into place. If I can, if I can make sure that you just primarily label yourself white or black, then as soon as you step out of somebody's definition of what that looks like or what that means, I can snap you right back into place. 
If I can label you a bigot or an ally, then as soon as you step across the line, I can snap you back into place. If I can label you tolerant or intolerant according to this person or that agenda or this perspective, then as soon as you step out of line, I can snap you back into place. It's a strategy of control. If I can label you, I can control you. Are you pro this, anti that, un this, non that, re? The list goes on. If I can label you, I can control you. All these strings that bind you. All these strings that bind you so that you can't be free. And it's really hard to fight the battle you need to fight when you're bound up. Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment is to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That is the great commandment of the good shepherd. But the thief, the stranger, knows that that's what you've been given to do. Been, you've been given to do. And he is shouting at you right now. He is shouting at you. He knows what you've been commissioned to do. He knows what you're called to do. So therefore, he is shouting at you because he knows how can you love Jesus with your whole heart when your heart is filled with anxiety about if your candidate will become president or not. How, how can you love Jesus with all your soul if you're surrendering your soul to gain the world? How, how can you love Jesus with your whole mind if it's consumed with trying to figure out whose side you're on and whose side, who is on your side? How can you love Jesus with all your strength when you are exhausted listening to so many voices? How can you love your neighbor as you love yourself when you don't even know who you are? In Matthew chapter 23, I know I told you guys, A59, you're in the right place. It's okay. This one's just going to be on the screen. Matthew 23, Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people, and they are supposed to be the the people who are representing him, representing God on the earth, called the scribes and the Pharisees. And he says this in Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you. Encouraging, right? Woe to you. Trouble to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. He says you put in so much effort into looking good on the outside, but inside you're a mess. You're so focused on what to say, what to do, where to stand, when to sit, who to vote for, which agenda to support, who you agree with, who disagrees with you. So, so focused. You're so focused on making sure that people approve of you, that you don't offend anyone, that you post the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right people with the right hashtag so you can get the right label. You have become so focused on what everyone wants from you. You've become distracted from what everyone needs from you. You have become so focused on distractions. Are you listening? Are you listening? Do you hear people asking? And do you hear heaven calling? Asking you to know justice and know peace. 
See, the justice that humanity is hungry for is not a concept. The justice that humanity is hungry for is not the result of a trial. The justice that humanity is hungry for is not an opinion. Justice is a person. Isaiah 59, I'm going to read you a whole bunch of verses this morning. Can you read with me? Isaiah 59, starting in verse 14, justice is turned back. You just nod a few times. If anything starts to sound familiar, remotely relevant. I mean, I know it's hard to find yourself in the Bible sometimes, but maybe, just maybe this morning. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. If you felt like that, if you walk away from the wrong thing, it's like you make yourself vulnerable. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was somebody, no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede Then his own arm brought him salvation. His righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to... According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and the glory of from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which is the wind, which the wind of the Lord drives, and a redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from their transgression, declares the Lord. Lord. There is justice. There is justice and his name is Jesus. He is the beginning and the end. He is the righteous requirement and the righteous fulfillment. He is the one to whom you are indebted and the one who pays your debt. Church, do you know what you need to do in this hour? No justice. No justice. No justice. No Jesus. No Jesus. Are you listening? The streets are begging it of you. No justice. No justice. Do you know justice? No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice, no peace. Isaiah 59, starting back at the beginning to the first half. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs. They weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies, and from one that is crushed, a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. I wonder if this makes any sense to anybody this morning. The way of peace, they do not know. And there is somebody, no justice in their paths and they have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. No justice. No peace. 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 Peace is not a concept. Peace is a person. Peace is a person, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called. Come on, somebody, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and let the people shout, Prince of Peace. 
Prince of Peace. Peace is a person and his name is Jesus. Peace is a person and his name is Jesus. His face is what peace looks like. His words are what peace sounds like. His presence is what peace feels like. His life is what peace looks like. It's a man and his name is Jesus. The streets are shouting. Heaven is shouting. Are you listening? Are we listening, church? Woe to you, Christians. Hypocrites. Who strive to get everything right on the outside for all to see. But on the inside, you do not know justice. You do not know peace. We become so focused on distractions, church. We become so focused on distractions. And the truth is that we, as a people, as individuals, and in this time, we are losing our focus in a time where we are needed the most, where our focus is needed the most. We become distracted in all of our efforts to know so many things, and yet we have become distracted from knowing the one that we need to know the most, the one that our world needs us to make known the most. Are you listening? Our distractions, our distractions are expensive. They're expensive, and, and you're feeling the price of it. If there's anything that's been highlighted in you this morning, if, you've, if the Lord is highlighting any distraction in your life, the reality is you are feeling the cost of that distraction. It's exhausting. <laughs> it costs relationships. It costs peace. It costs so much. Our distractions are expensive. They cost us so much. And our distractions, they, they, they cost us each other. They cost each other so much. It's expensive when we get distracted, and it costs our world so much. When we are so distracted by what the world wants from us, we cannot give the world what the world needs from us. And that is an expensive price for the world to pay for our distractions. For our distractions. That Matthew 23, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating because as I read through the Gospels, as I look at the way Jesus lived his life, it's amazing how so many times everybody wanted to come to Jesus and talk to Jesus about everybody else. And he had this annoying habit of saying, we can talk about them, let's talk, let's talk about you first. Like, Ooh, I don't want to talk about me. Let's talk about them. I, it's way easier to talk about them. It's way easier to look at them. It's way easier to categorize them, to deal with them, to talk about them. It's so much easier to, let's not talk about me. But Jesus, all through the scriptures, talks to his people first. He talks to his people first, not just out of anger, not just out of frustration, but out of hope. Because he knows who you are better than you know who you are. He knows the power that's inside of you better than you know the power that's inside of you. He knows his spirit better than you know his spirit. He knows salvation better than you know salvation. He knows what you're capable of more than you know that what you are capable of. And so that's why he speaks to his people first, even with intense language like, woe to you hypocrites, we got to get free from this. It costs too much. And this morning, I'm calling us to two things. Number one, repent. Us as a people, us as a church, us, us as the church, you as a believer, repent. Repent, turn from the world that you are chasing and seek his face. Turn from the voices you are listening to and seek his voice. Turn from the strangers you might be following and know him. Stop obsessing over the outside and get desperate and honest on the inside. Repent. Turn that you might find life and life abundantly. 
Repent, church. Repent. What a gift. See, I've been praying for you this week, and I, I, I've been praying this prayer for me so much, even just more this year, but especially in, in these days. God, in your mercy, Holy Spirit, convict me. See, we don't like talking about the judgment of God, but in these days, my prayer has been more than ever before. God, let me experience your judgment severely. I need your judgment in my life. We talked a few weeks ago about how your life is short, right? This is, this is going fast, and at the end, I'm going to stand before Jesus and give account for my life. And in that moment, anything that I didn't turn from, I don't have the choice to turn from it anymore. And I'll be saved as a believer. I'm welcomed in as a child, but the Bible is also clear. I will experience loss as by fire. For it's the things that I held on to of this world that I cannot take with me into eternal life because it is not born of God. And so, God, in your mercy, let me know your judgment now while I can turn. Let me know your judgment now while I can refuse it. Let me know your judgment now while I can turn away from the voice of the stranger and spend my short life responding to the voice of the good shepherd. Something we're scared to talk about, but there is life and life abundantly in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He is leading you into life. He only convicts you of things that the stranger is calling you to. He only convicts you of things that are stealing from you. He only convicts you of things that are killing you. He only convicts you of things that are out to destroy you. Oh God, lead us in repentance that we might find life and life abundantly, that we might know justice, that we might know peace for a world that is crying for someone. To know justice and know peace. Church, we have to repent. And number two, we are called to pray. I'm calling you, church, to pray. I'm calling us, church, to pray. Isaiah 59, 16, we read it earlier. It says, talking about the Lord, he saw that there was no man and he wondered that there was no one to intercede. The Lord looked on the earth in the midst of the the turmoil listed in Isaiah 59 that just sounds so strikingly familiar to the news channel that whatever it was that you watched this week, every single news channel, every single front page, it reads like Isaiah 59 and it says the Lord looked down and wondered. There is no one to intercede. There is no one to intercede. And his own arm brought him salvation. And his righteousness upheld him. This is the goodness and the grace of our God. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. That even when no one stands to intercede, he says, you know what, I'll do it. (laughs) I'll do it. I'll become my own salvation. I'll stand on my own righteousness. I'll bring my own salvation, and that is who Jesus is, church. And so the call to us is not to come up with something that God cannot do, but to partner with God in what he is doing. The Bible says that Jesus stands for us and intercedes on behalf, on our behalf. What is this intercession that we're calling to? It's kind of a church word that you may or may not be familiar with. Very simply, it it means something like, you know, intercession is to stand in the gap between the gap between what God desires and what you can see. Stand in the gap between what God desires, what you can see, and agree with God. That's what it means to intercede. It means that when you stand in the gap between the rebellion of humanity and the mercy of God. Intercession is when you believe for a move of God. It's when you step in and say, you know what? I'll sign up to push back the spiritual strongholds. I'll sign up to make straight in the desert the highway for our God. I'll sign up and believe that now is revival. I wish it would feel different than this and look different than this, but maybe it is this desperation that revival really feels like. That's what intercession is. It's when there's no other option. There is nothing more you can say. There is nothing more you can do. You must pray. Intercession is when you break. And greed and self-indulgence and self-righteousness and hypocrisy begins to leak out of you and the Holy Spirit begins to fill you and he begins to teach you And he begins to transform you. And he begins to teach you how to pray. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. 
You're called to intercession. You're called to prayer, church. So here's how I want us to respond. The first thing, and we'll, we'll kind of loop back around on this in a second. I got a few more minutes left, and I need you to stay, pay really close attention. I'm calling us to repentance, and I'm calling us to pray. And here's how we're going to respond in prayer in the immediate. If you, was anybody here in February when Jonathan Tremaine Thomas came to town? Our friend J- J.T. Thomas, he was here for witness conference in February. Man of God, a good friend of our house. He has an organization called Civil Righteousness. And he's based out in St. Louis, Missouri. And he is organizing some, a nationwide event happening uh, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, August 8th, called Pray on MLK. Pray on MLK. It's a historical national event where the church is gathering across denominations and races and beliefs and backgrounds. And we are standing and gathering together shoulder to shoulder to pray for a move of God in our nation. Because we are called to pray. It is time for the church to lift up one voice, united in prayer, called to action. So next week, instead of having church on Sunday, we're having church on Saturday. Instead of church Sunday here, 9 and 1045, we're having church downtown at, uh, what's it called? Wa- yeah, I know, but what's it called? Watkins. We're having church at Watkins Park Saturday, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. That's where church is happening this coming Saturday. And from 601 to 701, we're gathering with other churches and believers in this city to line up on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, socially distanced, shoulder to shoulder. Not to shout, not to protest, to pray. To pray, to unify under the name and the will of Jesus and pray. August 8th, that's 601, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed. August 8th, at 601, 2020, the people of this nation are going to gather and they're going to pray. They're going to pray. They're going to pray for a move of God. They're going to pray not that the mantle of leadership of reconciliation would fall on a man but on a people. The church of Jesus. That we would repent and we would pray. For an hour, we're going to pray together. And then from 7 to 8, we're all going to gather back in the park. And our team, as as well as some other worshipers from the city, we're going to lead for an hour of prayer and worship and song in the park across denominations and churches and lift up the victory of Jesus. Lift up the name of Jesus. Saturday, we're having church. Now, I know there's so many questions on the practical side of things. But I'm asking you to be there. I'm calling you to be there. For that hour of prayer, we're going to have a prayer guide for you. We're going to record this week a podcast that is an hour, basically a a podcast prayer meeting that you'll be able to listen to during that hour so that people on the street, we're all listening and being guided through the same prayer time. It's going to be amazing. We're going to equip you and do everything we can. We're going to pray. We're going to pray as a collection of worshipers, not divided by a denomination or affiliation or other dimensions of any way we would define ourselves. We are unifying under the blood of Jesus. The hope is that multiple churches with different backgrounds, denominations, ethnicities, all worshiping together. For if reconciliation can't find its foundation in the church, where is it going to be found? We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. This is the hour in history for the church to take its rightful place in the gap between a broken generation, a broken reality, and the dreams of God. To cry out for healing. To cry out for restoration. There are so many social narratives driving our nation. There are so many voices. And sadly, the value of righteousness, the value of prayer has been put to the sidelines, seen as a strategy of old. And screaming and riots are the preferred strategy of the moment. But people of God, let us pray. Let us gather together and let us pray, believing that if we can gather together in faith, we may not have to move the world with our protests, but maybe we can move the earth with our prayers. I want to tell you what we are doing. We are standing in the gap for our nation. We are asking for the eyes and the hearts of men to be open, for the soil of human hearts to be tilled. That is what we are doing. We are asking for the deconstruction of mental strongholds that prevent love. We are standing in the gap. We're also standing in the gap of grief. The reality is, just like Isaiah 59 says, people are dying. People are dying. People are losing family and friends. And as intercessors, we stand in the gap and we repent. We repent on behalf of our nation. And so our prayer is not, oh God, forgive those people out there. It is the prayer that God gives us in his word. Oh God, forgive us. 
We have sinned and we repent. Come and heal our land. Here's what we are not doing. We're not victim blaming. We're not highlighting or condemning any political party. We're not countering or aligning with any political movement. We're not asking the world for permission to gather as the church and stand and declare peace. We're not making signs that condemn or criticize or comment or or anything on current government policy or the police or education system or any potentially politicized words or entity or any of that stuff. We are standing in faith. We are not here for anybody else's agenda but Jesus' agenda. We are not judging anybody. We are standing in faith before God as His children and His church to agree with His heart to see earth, to see heaven on earth. I know there's a lot of reasons why this is touchy. I know there's a lot of of reasons why this is complicated. And I know practically there's a lot of reasons why this is inconvenient, but we are not doing this because this is an exciting event to be a part of. We're doing this because we believe this is a God moment. This is a God moment and the church needs to stand and be counted. Stand and be accounted for we stood in this moment. Families, I mean, especially for you with your kids, this is inconvenient. It's prime time for dinner and bed. (laughs) But I'm asking you to be there. I'm asking you to be there. Bring some sandwiches. There's a playground there. You may come and not even actually quote unquote pray and you play with your kids, but your faith made you show up. And it is faith that pleases God. It is faith that moves mountains. It's not you standing on the street or doing it just right. Can you show up and be counted? I want you to be there, church. I've never asked for our church this strongly to be at anything before. Please be there. You've been wondering what to do. You've been asking, what can we do? I can't get behind the riots. I can't get behind the fires. I can't feel like I I can't find any even statement to say that's not tied to a thousand other things. I, I don't know what I can do. What can I do? This is what you can do. You can pray. You can pray. You can gather with the church and you can pray. What else would we be waiting for, church? And will we miss it because it might be slightly inconvenient? I'm not going to miss it. It's inconvenient as a dad. It's inconvenient as a pastor, but I'm not going to miss it. I'm not sacrificing this moment on the altar of my convenience. We got to be there. So I'm calling you to be there and I'm calling you to do your best to let this message spread to all your friends, all the churches, everybody's invited. Come and let's pray. Will you stand this morning as we finish our few moments together? I want to make sure that we have space to respond and that's what next Saturday is all about, to respond in prayer. But I'm asking you right now, we need to make a few minutes. I want you to respond if there's anything you need to repent for. Is God highlighting anything in your life, anything you have become distracted by that is expensive and costing you? The invitation is to turn and find life and life abundant. If you need to repent, I'm just saying, just do it. It doesn't have to look a certain way. You might want to come up to the front. We're going to have our prayer team up here if you want somebody to pray with you. You might stay right where you are. But don't let anything keep you back from experiencing the freedom that the Holy Spirit's highlighting for you right now. It's worth it for you. It's worth it for them to turn and have the church lead in repentance in our our day. God, come and lead us into freedom. Can I pray for us as we close this morning? Jesus, we love you. And we invite you right now, Holy Spirit, convict us to the core of anything and everything that is holding us back from life and life abundant. I pray that we wouldn't hold on to anything, that nothing else would be sacred except your word and your agenda. Lord, we confess that we have sinned. Lord, we confess of our hypocrisy. We confess, we confess of cleaning the outside of the cup and leaving the inside a mess. We confess of trying to make the outside of the tomb look so good and being full of dead bones on the inside. God, bring life. Bring rest direction to the church right now. God, we choose in faith in this moment. This is the hour to hear your voice. This is the hour to respond. For any way we've dropped the ball, we repent, but we're looking forward, Jesus. We're looking forward into where you are calling us, into what we can do, into where we can go, into who we can love, into who we can reach. And so we're doing it, Jesus. Come 
and break out in us, Holy Spirit. And as we gather to pray next week, Lord, we're crying out for a city. We're crying out for a nation. Lord, what if you mean what you said? That if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and return from their wicked ways, that you will hear from heaven, that you will bring your own salvation, that you will bring your own righteousness and heal our land. Oh God, come and have your way. I'm done trying to look good on the outside, Jesus. Who cares what they have to say? I don't report to them, Lord. We report to you. Come and set us free right now and break out in us in Jesus' name.